Welcome to another Scots Way podcast. Today we're joined by Henry Bell. Hello, Henry. Hi, yeah. Um, writer, editor and uh, producer, and we'll talk to you about all those roles uh, later. But I'm going to start off with writer, because you've written this book, John McLean, Hero of Red Clydeside, and immediately appealed to me because I'd heard of John McLean and that he um, had caused tanks to appear in George Square back in the day, but I didn't know much else. And what your book does brilliantly is to fill in the gaps in my knowledge. Can you give us a bit of background to John McLean? Yeah, so a hundred years ago, uh, I wouldn't have needed to. John McLean was kind of perhaps the, one of the most famous Scots in the country. He was certainly the most famous communist and revolutionary, and he was discussed week in, week out in the War Cabinet by Lloyd George, um, the head of military intelligence, called him the most dangerous man in Britain. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and he was a, a socialist and an organiser and an educator from Glasgow. But... Uh, as you might have noticed, the revolution didn't happen, and so his his legacy has been not quite what he expected it to be. But I think he's still a kind of important figure, a hugely important figure. And it seemed to me that he almost set a, a, a template for um, sometimes for better and worse, but a kind of Glasgow or West of Scotland firebrand speaker, or maybe not even West of Scotland, maybe Scottish is would be the best way of putting that. That kind of followed him because he drew huge crowds, um, was was massively popular, as you say, everyone kind of knew who he was, and we'll talk a little bit about his funeral, which kicks the book off. Um, would you say that's fair, that this that this is someone who influenced uh, politically a lot of the people who came after him? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a type that he, that he represented, sort of the archetype of, and it, it's kind of connected to to this idea of almost like a, a left-wing minister, isn't it? Yeah. Something kind of moving from the Kirk to the Labour Party. Uh, and yeah, certainly him him in his street corner meetings with, at times, you know, tens of thousands of people listening to him uh, speak against imperialism and against the war. I definitely, I mean, I think there's no question that people like Jimmy Reid and, you know, Tommy Sheridan, yeah. better or worse, modelled themselves in some ways on that, on that idea. And, you yeah. know, George Galloway's broad brim black hat has... <laughs> McLean has danced for that as well, maybe. It's it's interesting. I could, I could talk to you for a long time about George Galloway, that's for sure. But um, yeah, that's these are exactly the kind of people I was thinking. I mean, you know, a lot of uh, trade unionists that were big in, in the seventies and eighties so had that kind of background as well. And even I suppose someone like Alex Ferguson, you know, who could hold a room and had this kind of yeah, I suppose personality, but a real um, use of language that just seemed to inspire. And there was certainly John McLean seemed to inspire. Yeah, I think the big feature of McLean's is this real respect for language and rhetoric and culture. And, uh, you know, sometimes communism can get painted as being a little uh, philistine, a little kind of anti those things. Mm-hmm. But I think it was it was crucial to him. And, uh, you know, he loved reading and poetry and uh, and kind of turn of phrase was, was key to him. And I think that's another reason that his, his legs lives on, you know, the, his famous speech from the dock in 1918 is just fantastically well written. It's a beautiful piece of writing. I think um, it's a, he's a character that in so many ways typified um, modern or recent modern Scotland because you say um, educated as well, in fact a teacher. And um, you, you're talking about the religious aspect. It does seem where kind of Calvinism and communism kind of clash in this thing. And uh, his his political power, for want of a better word, maybe power's the wrong word, but his political influence really did reach far and wide, you know, not just in the UK, but um, the Kremlin were familiar with him as well and um, kind of held him up as a, a, a kind of prototype for what could happen in Britain. Yeah, no, I mean, if, if circumstances had been different, I think uh, Maclean would would maybe be remembered as a, as a Marxist educator and as a sort of uh, forefigure of, of Scottish socialism, but because of the First World War happening when it did, and because of kind of chance meetings he had with the Irish and Russian left yeah. in the years before that in, in Glasgow, um, he became kind of representative, yeah, of, of this international left that resisted the war, and that included, you know, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky, and, and uh, you know, when the Russian Revolution finally happened and they had the third... Uh, Congress of Russian Soviets, uh, McLean was elected by the workers as honorary president of the Russian Soviet, which, you know, was a huge honour. It kind of shows the magnitude of what was expected from him, I think, really, that 
that you know among among Bolsheviks there was a real feeling that Maclean might break the British Empire on the Clyde. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to the end, if you like, as you do in the book. I mean, it's quite uh, fitting that we are talking in kind of near Pollock Shield and stuff, Bungo area, because the book opens with his funeral and. Well, you describe it better than me. The people who are just hanging out their windows to get to celebrate the life of this man. Yeah, well, it's fitting-ish. McLean didn't have much time for Strathbungo. He, <laughs> he was fired from his job here quite early on. Uh, he he taught a few places around here, didn't he? Mm. King Park and but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, across the south side. I mean, he was moved from school to school throughout the south side. Basically, every time the parents objected to. <laughs> <laughs> him well refusing to teach the bible was actually the main thing rather than uh, his socialism but uh, but yeah no when when he died in 1923 um the procession met at Eglinton Toll in front of what's now the star bar mm-hmm. and uh and you know the the papers at the time estimate uh around 10 000 to 20,000 people ended up marching back to his house Old House Road in Pollock Shores and uh and it was known as the silent march at the time it was written up as that that these you know Thousands and thousands of workers and uh, unemployed people and trade unionists and politicians all marching in near complete silence with a with the uh, Clyde Workers Brass Band at the front leading them. Yeah, an incredible uh, scene, and it was captured on film and shown uh, in cinemas wow. around the West of Scotland. It was also shown uh, locally on the anniversary of his death every year by the um, the Proletarian Sunday School in the South Side. But the film has been lost since. So hopefully it's in an attic somewhere in Govan Hill. Um, with, was there any knock-on effect from his death? And politically, uh, was there a kind of rise up or was, it, was that an end in itself? But yeah, by the time of, of Maclean's death, he was quite an isolated figure for a few reasons. He'd, he'd refused to compromise on... Uh, on his communism, he refused to work with those socialists who, you know, such as Maxton and Wheatley, who uh, uh, were perhaps willing to be more moderate and work within the system. And he also uh, refused to compromise with London rule. And he, he saw what was happening in Ireland as a kind of prototype for what could be done here and, and that Scottish independence, he thought, was kind of the quickest route to, to kind of liberation for the workers, uh, which interestingly kind of was a huge tactical mistake at the time. It maybe almost destroyed his political career at the time. But it's also maybe why we're still talking about him as well, that he kind of, he formed the first party that supported Scottish independence, for instance, and, and kind of marked a way that people like Hamish Henderson and Hugh McDermott really kind of grasped onto later. Yeah, that, I have to find that fascinating because I think that's still a pool which is in Scottish politics today. This idea of, in one hand, wanting to be an internationalist but on the other hand, seeing that maybe the only way to do that is to become independent. So you've got this nationalism and international clashing. And, and I think it was Hugh McDermott that particularly thought about, you know, member of the Scottish Nationalist Party and member of the Communist Party. And um, these polar opposites are kind of where extremes meet, you know, it is something that um, McLean, well, was he the person that kind of gave that uh, an understanding that, that's, that, thought intellectually, yes, I mean, because at the beginning he didn't want, didn't think nationalism was the way forward at all, mm. did he? And was it the Irish situation that changed his mind? Yeah, I think it was, I think it was a few things that happened kind of as, you know, as the First World War ended and kind of as Lenin said that the, the war will end but it'll become civil wars and, and the Easter Rising was one example of that, but also Maclean was very interested in the, in the Million Man March in Egypt against mm-hmm. the British occupation in Cairo and also... Uh, that the the kind of first stirrings of Congress in India and the Indian resistance uh, kind of resurging after the war, and so he just saw Scotland as a as a kind of having a similar potential I yeah. think, for for Strong Yeah, he, he he very clearly wrote that um, that he wanted a, a you know a Commonwealth, a worldwide Commonwealth without borders and nations, but that. Scotland was a good place to start. Yeah, for that. And, uh, and that does seem to still. be I know many people who. Um, I mean, when I first started getting interested in politics in the late, even mid to late 80s, um, the idea that uh, the Scottish Nationalist Party would be a party of power, never mind in power, was kind of almost laughed at. Um, but now there are people that say, well, if I want to see the Scotland I want, whatever that may be, but for many people, a kind of 
um, left wing socialist Scotland to some extent, then we have to become independent to do that. And that seems to be, it was very interesting to me to read that McLean came to those, um, those similar ideas. He might have wanted to take things further for himself. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right for a lot of people that, that nationalism does kind of serve that purpose. But interestingly, I think McLean uh, was also very clear that, that, you know, he had no time for any kind of bourgeois nationalism mm-hmm. and that, that he was just as happy to, you know, he, he even on the uh, anniversary of the Treaty of Arbroath, he went up to Arbroath not to join in the commemorations, but specifically to lambast the nationalists and say, how dare you celebrate our growth when you know Scottish soldiers uh, yeah. are killing people in India and Ireland, and you know we can't you can't pretend that Scotland isn't part of uh, of oppression as well. So yeah, so yeah, I think he kind of cuts an interesting line in amongst the nationalisms that we see today. Um, you mentioned his refusal uh, to compromise, and that runs throughout the book. I mean, he was imprisoned and starved and, and tortured. Is that a fair term? Um, but yet he refuses to, to, to give an inch, it seems. Is that fair? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it was kind of interesting spending the two years researching the book and, and reading his letters. I, was, I kind of feared the whole time that I'd come to dislike him. <laughs> you know, that I, that I would... I know exactly, absolutely. Um, yeah. because, he's, because he's so, so stubborn, so thrown, so willing to sacrifice... Pretty much everything. I mean, course. family and friendships and... And I think the I think the suffering of his wife, Agnes, uh, is, is perhaps the hardest thing to take mm. about his life, that he really, really did not believe that he could um, put the needs of, of the working class second to mm. the needs of his family. He wasn't ever willing to do that. And if it, you know, it's a spoiler, but if it, if it wasn't for the fact that there's a reunion between them in the end, and that and that some kind of amends is made for that, I think it, 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 he'd be a, an unsympathetic character, perhaps mm-hmm. in some ways. But as it is, I think you kind of you have to admire the fact that he was so total in his belief in humanity. And you know, it's interesting. Also, he had two daughters, um, and uh, one of them. Um, completely continued his legacy and devoted yeah. herself to, to social politics, a very prominent uh, Trotsky, Trotskyist, sorry. <laughs> but, um, and the other completely uh, dismissed politics and moved away from it. And, and I, I've kind of gathered from other family members felt really some resentment towards what McLean had done to their family for the cause. And I think it's, mm. easy, it's easy to see yeah. both of those reactions. It is. There? And you, I think you, you often see that in... Uh, the relationship with his wife or the way his, his wife there's an, there is an admiration because you, you work with a lot of letters and a lot of correspondence and things like that uh, there's admiration but there's also we need you as well mm. there's that pool there you know how, how are we going to survive when because he sends them away doesn't he to the borders yeah yeah they go to stay with family um, and uh, and you know in in the in their final reunion in the last letter it turns out to be the last letter obviously he didn't know that that he writes yeah. to Agnes he says you know the tragedy for you is that I must go down with the red flag at topmast and and he does he collapses a few days later giving a speech uh, at a cinema in the Gorbals and dies with his family in his house in Port Shores but having never compromised and having not listened to her pleas you know and she was only asking that he take a year away from the struggle but she must have been um, so. Uh, horrified at the way he was treated in prison, for instance, as you say, you know, I mean, he, he was uh, brought. Do you think his death was caused by the way he was treated in prison? Yeah, I think it's it's hard to to see a way in which it wasn't brought on. I mean, yeah, Agnes was was petrified from every time he went in. He could have served five prison sentences for his opposition to to the war. Um, and each one kind of more more brutal than the last. So, you know, by 1918, his famous speech, he was taken to Peterhead, which was the only convict jail in the country. So when um, when the Scottish legal system stopped deporting people to Australia, they needed a place to put people, and it was the Buchan Coast. So, so you could have gone to Australia and then get Peterhead <laughs> yeah, instead. <laughs> yeah, Australia might have been better for his health, that's true. But... Um, but yeah, and while he was up there, he was on a hunger strike. Um, so he was force-fed uh, every day. He was 
constantly watched by um, wardens and he was um, kind of really uh, spied on and documented to an incredible extent. You go to the uh, records office in Princess Street, the papers from Peter had a huge document, you know, every everything that McLean says, everything that he will or won't eat, um, how he's force-fed every day. And, you know, force-feeding at that time was literally just a rubber mm. pipe down your neck and uh, some sort of mix of margarine and bovril poured down it. Um, and just the year before, Thomas Asher, the Republican uh, fighter, had been had been killed um, by force-feeding in a British jail. So, so I think Agnes would have been very aware of that as well. And there was a lot of popular... Sympathy for McLean because of it, as there had been uh, in Scotland with um, with the suffragettes, when Helen yeah. Crawford had been force fed, that was a kind of national issue, and and it was the same for McLean, not just in Scotland, but you know the Royal Albert Hall was filled with supporters for McLean calling his release. There were ten thousand people uh, met in Finsbury Park in London in a demonstration for him, and in Glasgow there were kind of clashes in the town where people uh, tried to occupy the trams, and I think there were some forty or fifty arrests at pro McLean mm-hmm. demonstrations. So was a huge issue and you know uh, uh, Tom Johnson the later Scottish Secretary um, said at the time that McLean was actually more useful to socialism in jail than out of it because he generated so much sympathy there. We should say a bit I think to the extent of his popularity um, what kind of crowds would turn up to hear him speak? Yeah, so th- throughout the war he'd met um, on Bath Street every Sunday for anti-war meeting, often with other speakers like Patrick Dolan, Helen Crawford, Agnes Dolan. And, um, and in the early days of the war it would, it would be in the hundreds, but by, by the later stage of the war when, when kind of, I guess, the sheer brutality of the slaughter and, and the pointlessness of the war was becoming evident, uh, it, would, it would often be thousands and thousands of people who would hear him. And the most famous McLean meeting is, is after that spell in jail when he's released... Um, six months into a five-year sentence due to the public pressure uh, and the war's end is released and he arrives at uh, Buchanan Street Station and is met by, well, the Daily Record at the time estimates some 70,000, the Socialist Papers estimate 100,000, um, <laughs> huge numbers of striking workers, the shipyard's empty, the factory's empty and uh, he's kind of dragged on a cart down Buchanan Street by the workers, he's flying a huge red flag and a uh, the tens of thousands of people chant uh, victory to the German Revolution there just days after the war's end. So kind of, you know, an incredible draw. And, yeah. And, you know, most of those people perhaps wouldn't um, have classed themselves as certainly not as revolutionary socialists, maybe not even as socialists, but there was, I think, massive respect for his integrity and for the victories that had been won for, for yeah. the working class in Glasgow. You know, the, the rent strike that he was associated with was perhaps the biggest political victory that had, that had ever been won in the city and the um, conditions of workers uh, were in real peril at that moment after the war with uh, 200,000 demobilising Scottish soldiers returning home and, and a fear about what that would mean for everyone's jobs so it was really a moment where people wanted to listen to his message. And yeah because it should be said he, he wasn't just um, a revolutionary in thought, but also indeed, I mean, there were victories, there were quite significant political victories, which probably, you know, you mentioned that he was known as the most dangerous man in Britain. That, that These were real threats to the, the status quo. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Glasgow was kind of in this uh, fascinating position where its entire industry was turned towards the war effort. And, um, you know, the the threat of strike action on the Clyde, particularly in, in 1915, um, mm. at the time of the rent strikes, really could have brought the war to a halt for the British. It, it was an extreme fear of um, Lloyd George's, who was at the time uh, managing the situation. He was kind of sent up to pacify uh, the natives uh, unsuccessfully. He was heckled, uh, <laughs> thrown out of St Andrew's Hall. Um, from that moment on, the government uh, made a policy of stockpiling huge amounts of munitions because they didn't feel they could rely on the Clyde to keep producing for the war effort. And that, yeah. was, that was due to people like Willie Gallagher, John McLean, James Maxton campaigning against the war and for workers' rights in the city. So you said that you were worried after spending two years researching the book that you might not like the man at the end of it. What do you think about the man having written the book? Well, yeah, he's got... Um, you know, such a reputation for a kind of stern doing it's, it's funny, all the other uh, 
great figures of Red Clay to kind of have a, a friend, you know, it's always Jimmy Maxton, yeah. David Kirkwood, and you never really get Johnny McLean. It's always, <laughs> it's always a bit more formal. And, you know, he's, there's a, a document that uh, a friend of his kept. It's kind of a personality test thing from when he's a teenager, and he records that his favourite drink is water and his favourite food is porridge. <laughs> and, and he was teetotal his whole life. He, he never drank. He kind of, although he left... Um, the secessionist Kirk as a teenager, the, that kind of free Kirk mentality really stayed with him. So uh, so I think I expected to find uh, someone that was quite severe mm-hmm. and stubborn and difficult. And actually, I think that there's a lot of, of kind of charm and yeah, lightness to right. McLean as well, and a lot of warmth. And I think uh, his letters to his daughters and his mm-hmm. wife particularly bring that out. And also, you know, he's, he's uh, he likes to make a joke. One of my favourite things I came across was you know, during the big trials against him for sedition during the war, he was um, accused in the papers of being a, a collaborator with the Kaiser, that he was being paid by Germany to spread disaffection in Scotland. Uh, and at that time, he'd kind of go to street corners in the south side and start his meetings by opening a briefcase and shouting, German gold, get your German gold here. <laughs> so, no, I, 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 I actually found him you know, more of a laugh than I expected. <laughs> and uh, why did you want to write the book in the first place? Um, I'd kind of been, you know, I, one of my first memories of, of moving to Glasgow, was, you know, 11 years ago was, was going into the People's Palace and seeing mm-hmm. his, his desk there and reading, you know, the, the very small amount of information they have about this figure that, yeah, as we've said, was kind of celebrated by Lenin and Trotsky and led these huge, uh, strikes on the Clyde and, uh, and kind of from that time I've kind of gathered anything I could about him because he just wasn't a figure that that I'd ever heard of yeah. with that and then kind of in parallel being um, interested in poetry and music and stuff you kind of you come across him you know Eddie Morgan wrote a poem about him Hugh McDermott wrote several Sully McLean wrote several the famous Hamish Henderson songs so he would just pop up in all these places uh, and then out of that I, I just wanted to, to find out more and I, I kind of found out that there was no book about him in yeah. print yeah. Um, you know Nan Milton his daughter wrote an excellent uh well, she wrote his biography twice. She wrote it once, and it was left on a on a subway train and never recovered. <laughs> she spent years writing it again. It was published in the seventies, and it's a great book, but it was out of print. And um, and so kind of from that, I just felt that uh, that there should be a book about him, and also that a lot of the documents um, were declassified now, and they hadn't been. Ah, uh, of course. So there were two biographies of McLean written in the seventies, um, but they didn't have access to the documents. Uh, that, that now can be seen. There's, there's actually a small stack of documents yet to be declassified. Yeah. I do wonder what can possibly be in them <laughs> that the state's still worried about. But yeah. And and was it a case of just of doing that, you know, hitting the libraries and getting the documentation that you could do? You mentioned the family. Did you have contact with them? Yeah, I did. I mean, um, his daughter, Nan Milton, uh, who, who died in the 90s, was, was absolutely committed to kind of uh, continuing his legacy so she collected together every letter and diary that she could and they're all in the National mm-hmm. Library so there's a, a really amazing McLean archive there um, and I, I did I did speak to his, his three grandchildren uh, quite a bit about kind of not their, not their memories of McLean because of course he died mm, before sure. they were born but their their memories of Agnes and of a kind of of that house in Cultural Road it's kind of astonishing that they as you know small children live in a house that, uh, you know, that Trotsky had <laughs> sent telegrams to and that had this this place in the socialist world. Um, the other kind of big record is is the police and military intelligence and court records, which, of I mean, are boxes and boxes and boxes of them. And I felt quite complicit uh, sometimes mm. with those things when, you know, he he suffered, obviously, the, the literal torture of force feeding and of separation from his family, but also he was followed really for years by reporters uh, for the secret police who would openly take notes of everything he was saying and following him around and kind of the pressure of that um, on him and on his comrades and his friends because he, he did come to to be deeply paranoid. And yeah, I was going to say his state of mind really was changed by it. Yeah, I, I think he was hardened to a lot of people. Um, and I mean, and there's no doubt that there were people informing on him and following him at all times and so... It was a case that he was paranoid, uh, but also that they were following him. So, so kind of having having access to that information and using it felt 
Yeah, I an uncomfortable thing. It's an incredible record, but it's also uh, you know a record of something terrible that was done to to someone. Yeah, I, so I, I guess I, you know, almost like a voyeuristic thing that you're mm. you're using this pain and you're creating. Yeah, I don't know. Um, having written it, would you do another book is along those lines? Another biography? Yeah, definitely would. I, yeah, I'd, I'd not written a book before, and I really enjoyed just kind of thinking about biography as a, as a form. I kind of never had. I'd never set out to write a biography. Yeah. Um, and I enjoyed it a great deal. I, it's it's quite satisfying to to be telling a story where you're trying to tell the truth in a way, but you're obviously grappling with what your truth about this person is and what you think mm-hmm. you've come to to know of them. Uh, I wouldn't do it soon, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, I guess it's, uh, it takes up almost all of your time. Uh, yeah, it took up kind of almost all my free time, and also I had no chat other than chat about the play for about two years. My girlfriend would say wherever we'd go in Scotland, I'd point out some, you know, tedious street corner where a particular speech had been made. She was sick of it. So, yeah, <laughs> I'd, I'd leave it a while. I'd like, uh, yeah, I'd like to make something up in between. <laughs> Um, well, to move on a little bit, because some of your time is also taken up with um, involvement with Gutter magazine, which is still, I'm pleased to say, delighted to say, still going strong. Um, there's a new one out, is it just now? Or is yeah, it? issue 19 is just out and about. Uh, you know, get it in categories books or lighthouse books or uh, online. Online, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, it's been such a great uh, publication for Scottish writing over its... Um, Lifetime, I'm just delighted that it is still going because I know things, uh, it's not been easy. How is it in terms of the format at the moment? It's a kind of cooperative of people who are running it, would you say? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, a, it's a workers' co op, so it's owned by the editors. Um, and it's, we've been uh, like that for three issues now, um, which is just a joy. I mean, the people involved are just really, really great and really dedicated to, yeah. to trying to. Provide what I think is a really important platform for Scottish writing. Oh, without I doubt. I think there needs to be more of these kind of journals and places that that you can find new writing and find new people and also see kind of what what the big names are up to as well. And that's quite a fun thing about it. But yeah, so it's it's the tenth year we've got to this year. So we've got issue twenty coming out in August. Fantastic. Um, and we're kind of looking to redesign it a bit and and kind of mix up what we do a little bit, but keep at the centre what is basically a kind of. Uh, a mission to find what's exciting in, mm-hmm. in prose and poetry in Scotland and beyond. I think it's hugely important because a lot of the uh, other journals uh, that were already in existence at the time were often linked uh, to academic institutions or things like that. And what Gutter seemed to do to me and still does is just say, whoever you are, whatever you write, send it in, we will take it under consideration. And there's been so many great um, Scottish writers that I first encountered in, in, in Gutter magazine. Yeah, totally. And I think it's also that the, the magazine's not, you know, not afraid to go with stuff that's genre or, you know, more populist or things that are very like, literary and avant-garde and, and kind of pushing boundaries in all different directions. I think it's nice to have something where you get to encounter all that different stuff together because... Because, uh, yeah, more academic journals have their place as well. Of course, yes. But, um, but yeah, I mean, when it started out 10 years ago, there were so many more magazines in Scotland mm, as well, yeah. and so many that had fallen by the wayside, and it kind of had got to a point a few years ago where it really felt like it was it was Gutter, The Dark Horse, and New Writing Scotland yeah. were the last magazine standing, and it, it's really nice to see that that's changed, because yeah. there's more and more uh, literary magazines and zines popping up, and so hopefully more of a kind of healthy culture of... It does seem, I mean, this might be wishful thinking, so <laughs> tell me if you think I'm wrong about this, but we maybe turned a corner in Scottish publishing and it did for a while look as though it was maybe in its last gasp, but um, that things have, have t- maybe turned for the better. Do you think that's fair or is that too soon to say? I hope it's true, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, there's publishers, new publishers doing brilliant things. I think like particularly 404 Inc mm-hmm. and Speculative Books who are doing kind of totally different stuff and discovering new talent and having big, big hits, yeah. like big books that, that shift copies. Um but I think the situation is still incredibly difficult for yeah, publishers. So yeah, I, mean, I think Amazon just is a, is a disaster. And I know, you know, 404 Inc. Uh, said recently that, you know, they were struggling with that and they need people to buy it through the website because it's just so hard to compete when Amazon takes 70% share. I mean, we're lucky in a way with Gutter that um, 
that although you know technically we're we're publishing it ourselves so we are a small scale independent publisher we just have this one project and it's direct sales through subscriptions and it's kind of manageable I think once your ambitions get bigger it's kind of hard, yeah, it's hard it's, to fight with the big uh, monopolies out there it's interesting I was because um, I've got a kind of foot in reviewing music as well as reviewing books and to compare small independent record labels with small independent publishers and there is again um Oh, we've obviously a kind of increase in the sale of vinyl and stuff, but people are, as far as I can tell, now starting to buy their music straight from the people that are making mm. it. And I'm hoping eventually that that will ha- people will wake up and realise that that is the best. If you want to, um, I was talking just recently to someone about this and saying that it used to be that you paid what you had to to get the record or the book, and now often you pay what you think it's worth you're willing to pay that to get it and so that people are being paid you know that are making it as well yeah no I think there is like a bit of a turn at a corner being turned about that because because it's also about objects isn't it I mean that's yeah. part of the vinyl thing is about having yeah. a physical thing that's come from the band or the artist to you and I think maybe people feel more like that about books yeah I think so yeah, yeah. Um, just before we finish you've uh, also um, uh, been involved in a lot of um, live performance and music venues um, Solace Festival I think you're involved in and uh, Chill Habibi as well talk a little bit about that aspect of your life yeah no I've, I, I've worked uh, for Novius uh, helping put on Solace Festival which I love actually it's um, it's in uh, Errol in Perthshire this year kind of a beautiful site overlooking the Tay and it it's great to get a chance actually to to book new music and mm-hmm. both, like you say having being able to be a bit in both of those worlds and see, you know, what's going on. Because uh, there's just, I mean, we were talking about the hits, the Dundee pop band. Yes. And, you know, it, it's thrilling to go and see a new band that you haven't heard before just, like, blow you away live. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, getting a chance to kind of put stuff like that on as well as kind of literary things and stuff. So we've got Jackie Kay and Chris McQueer and Juana Adcock and stuff. For Excellent. What else this year. So it's kind of a mix of talks and music. And, uh, yeah, I, I kind of, uh, I tend to do the kind of production stuff uh, to make ends meet (laughs) (laughs) write poetry when I can afford to yeah that sounds very familiar (laughs) well Henry thanks so much for talking to us today it's been an absolute treat Uh, cheers very much for having us and we'll be back soon with someone completely different cheers Mm -hmm.